Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. We're going through the book of Numbers, or also called Bamidbar, in the wilderness. We learn that in the wilderness, we have experiences. Uh, we, we take what the Father has given us, how he has revealed himself to us, his word, his heart, uh, revealing himself at, at Sinai. And now we learn to walk in his ways. And these are the things that we need to take a look at. What do we do? with the word once we have been given it. We receive it, but how? Do we receive it wholeheartedly? Do we try to filter it? Do we try to uh, uh, bring it, bring to where, well, no, I have to understand fully because, you know, his ways are higher than ours. There's some things we may not understand until, until we do it, and then there's other things we just may not understand. So we have to follow him. And that's one of the things we learn continually throughout the book. Matter of fact, Yeshua, when he came to his Talmudim, what one of the words he said? Follow me, okay. So, this was a uh, not a just a, a part time kind of a thing. We follow him. We learn to walk in his ways. So this parsha is beha alotcha, which starts off talking about the menorah and when you kindle the uh, the lamps on the on the menorah and uh, whether where they where they are to shine and the representations. There's a lot in that. Matter of fact, this whole parsha. It has a lot of different things that can be talked about, but I kind of want to focus on a couple things here today. I want to I want to bring out something regarding the trumpets and something regarding the ark that I feel is good for us today and good for relevant for uh, now. I believe it's something now that the Father wants to reveal and um, so good for us to follow. So without further delay, uh, let's let's get into it. We're going to start in the book of Numbers, the book of Bamidbar, in chapter nine, verse seventeen and eighteen. For it says, whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tent, the people of Israel continued their travels, and they camped wherever the cloud stopped. At the order of Adonai, the people of Israel traveled. At the order of Adonai, they camped. And as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they stayed in the camp. Verse 23, at Adonai's order, they camped. And at Adonai's order, they traveled. They did what Adonai had charged them to do through Moshe. So when it says at his order, uh, at his word, literally it's at the mouth of at the mouth of Yahweh, at the mouth of Adonai, they moved and they did everything they did because he said it. It was time. It wasn't just a matter of, okay, the cloud got up and moved. I believe he was instructing them along the way, because it says at the mouth of Adonai. So he would tell Moshe, you know, when they're moving, but all the people would see because the cloud would get up and the cloud would move. And start going in a direction, kind of like, hey guys, follow me, right? But then something was to be done as well in regards to the people. The people had a response, much like at Mount Sinai. When Yahweh spoke, it commanded a response from the people. It's not just a matter of Yahweh was speaking, no, no one was listening. He said, I'm going to speak with you, will you hear it? And the people said, yes, we will hear it. We, we will do, we will be obedient, we will do, and we will hear, right? A lot of the same thing here. When the when the Mishkan moved, the cloud would get up and go in the, the pillar, right? And it would go and it would move, and the people would learn to follow. And so we follow at his word. We follow at his voice. We follow him by the instruction that we receive from his mouth. We live at the word of Yahweh. Uh, Psalm 19.7 says, The Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the inner person. The instruction of Adonai is sure, making wise the thoughtless. James says, if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom, and continues, becoming not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work it requires, he will be blessed in what he does. See, so what we learn is that the word of Yahweh, his Torah, is, is life to us, and it can bring restoration to us. It can bring healing and health to us. I mean, the word of Yahweh is perfect, and we can be healed by his word, right? Much like Yeshua in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, the word was God, and it was that word that became flesh and dwelled among us. Okay, we, we, re we reach out to him, the living word of Yahweh. So his word can restore us. It can lead us into ways that are good. It can lead us into a path of life and blessing. It just shows us the Father's heart and teaches us his ways. Yeshua, as well, taught us to follow the word or follow the voice of Yahweh. We see in John 14, 10, he says, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own, 
but the Father dwelling in me does his works. And in John 15, 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Even, the, even this, Yeshua says, I know my sheep, they know me. You know, they hear my voice, they follow me. You know, all of these things is, are things that Yeshua has said. And it's no different for us. We still are following him. We still are walking in his ways. Uh, even though we don't dwell around the Mishkan, we still live according to the word of the Most High. We still live according to his heart, live according to his ways. We are still walking out daily what he has instructed to us. His instruction toward us has not changed. You know, to love one another, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. His instruction to us has not changed. Uh, it may look a little different nowadays, but it has not changed. So even in that, we are learning the heart of the Father. We are learning to hear his voice. And one of the things that was given to, to hear his voice and to gather the people together and to, and to know when to do what were the trumpets, the silver trumpets that were given, the silver trumpets and the shofar. We're going to talk about them in a second, but there is a warning in the midst of this. You know, Scripture says, lift up your voice like a shofar, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and, and, and declare things to Israel. And, and here's something. Just because someone is loud doesn't mean they're speaking on behalf of, of Yahweh. Just because someone is boisterous, or just because they're confident, does not mean that they're speaking on behalf of the Most High. We, have, we need to have some discernment. You know, there's, there's a lot of people out here just lifting up their voices and making a lot of noise and saying a lot, you know, saying a lot of things. But we need some discernment to know what to do. So it's not just about making noise. It's about knowing what to say, knowing when to say it, and knowing the appropriate response to what is said. All of these are important. And these are things that we have to consider as well. This is why we get in the Word to study the Word, because we need discernment. We need to know what the, what the heart of the Father is so that we can see what his will is. So, we, I mean, he tells us, he instructs us along the way, but it's not like he micromanages you. You know, you, you, you live your life, but we need to know what is his heart, what is his desires, and to know when someone is speaking contrary to what he is wanting for us. Again, just because somebody is loud doesn't make them right. Just because there's a whole group of people following them doesn't make them right. That's why the scripture tells us, don't go after the crowd. Don't follow after the crowd when the intent is, per is to pervert justice. Don't go with the majority just because it's a majority. You can be genuine even and be genuinely wrong. You know, you, you can really believe something wholeheartedly, but it's, even that doesn't make it right. You know, you can, you can believe something and still be wrong. So, again, all we're asking for now is just to get to the word of Yahweh, to discern his word, and to say, now what is my response to this word in my life? Well, how do I respond to what has been given to me? See? And then, then we'll learn how to do things along the way. So, so, in regards to these trumpets, these two silver trumpets, uh, in Numbers 10, 1 through 10, we see that they are of hammered silver. Uh, the silver trumpets are distinguished from the ram's horn in function as well as appearance. The ram's horn announced the Day of Atonement throughout the land in Leviticus 25.9, and it's used in the marching around the Jericho in Joshua 6, 2 through 21. Uh, we see other places as well. But the silver trumpets are, are called the people to action. The silver trumpets calls the people to a response. It was used by Pinchas in a battle against Midian. We see in Numbers 31.6. This is from... Uh, the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary on uh, Leviticus and Numbers. So, the silver trumpets had specific purposes, and silver in the scripture oftentimes represents atonement as well, so that's something interesting to speak of. So, his, uh, his redemptive voice is calling us to do something. So, what are some things about these uh, trumpets? What do we learn about them? Well, they were used to assemble the people. They were used to dispatch the people. They were used to call certain people, and they were used in battle, and they were used in worship. And all heard the trumpets, but not everyone was to respond every time. See, the trumpets gave certain calls and certain signals, and they were uh, to announce certain things. And the people had to know how to discern the voice of the trumpet 
to discern the voice that's coming forward so that they knew what their response to it was. If the response was to call the leaders among Israel to come to gather into the, to the tabernacle, so to speak, use as an example, uh, it wouldn't benefit them if they all came, you know, to prevent the leaders from coming in. If it was a call to go out to war and you thought it was the dinner bell, um, yeah, you're going to be sorely mistaken. <laughs> you know, just again, just as an example, but um, the, it, it does prove the point. So we had to learn to hear the trumpet, but not just to hear it, but to discern the sound and then to carry forward with the appropriate response. So Numbers 10, we, we read, Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work, you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. When both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the chiefs, the heads of the tribes of Israel, shall gather themselves to you. When you blow an alarm in the camps that are on the east side shall set out, verse 6, and when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown whenever they are to set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of our own, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. Look at that. That's something to note. The trumpet shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. Verse 9. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before Yahweh your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. On the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feasts and at the beginnings of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be a reminder of, a reminder of you before your God, I am Yahweh your God. So something we see in regards to this, that the trumpets blowing and sounding the alarm and all these different things that were going forth gives a sake of unity. The, all the people had to understand what was to be done. There was a unified response on behalf of this. And I believe one of the things it's pointing to is that, so let's just say as an example, my place that I feel is for me to be a trumpet crying out in the wilderness and crying out to the people. But if we're not doing so in a means to gather the people together, there's a problem. Okay, a lot of times we, we come across people who are just being loud and boisterous and making declarations and doing things. And I believe many could be doing so out of good intentions. But that's not to forsake the greater people. You know, it's, it's about gathering people in. If what we're doing is bringing division, strife, and contention, then there is a problem. We need to be a people who gather in the kingdom. And I understand there is a, a difference and there will be some tension when you start t uh, talking to people about sin and about clean and unclean and holy and common. Uh, there's some people who don't want to hear this. But again, how we present that is important. Are we presenting things because we care about the people we're talking to, or are we presenting it just because, well, I'm right and you're wrong? If that's the case, then we're not doing so according to the Father's heart. We should be working redemptively and restoratively and trying to bring people together, to gather people in together. It's not about just bringing people to me so that I can uh, continue to, to yell and let me be their voice. No, Yahweh is our voice. And we need to be a people declaring his words to gather in the kingdom and bring people in together. We need to be ones to bring the body together. I, I'm, I'm being very redundant here, but I want to overly stress this point. Okay? We need to be a people declaring certain sounds. And that certain sound should be a gathering in of people to show the heart of the Father that, that He cares for you, He loves you, there is a better way. Yes, we've been a sinful people, but we need to repent and come to Him and learn to walk in His ways. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor means you're going to tell them the truth. But again, how you do that, uh, it's yes, yeah, speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. There is a difference, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Again, uh, things that we're talking about, those silver trumpets, when they sound, we had a response. And if we didn't know the correct response, it could cause chaos. And I guess that's another point that I was trying to make, is that if we're not in unison in the sounds that are being declared by the Ruach, 
we can cause chaos in the camp, and we shouldn't be doing that. There needs to be order within the camp, right? So those that were in the proper authority who had been trained to do so made the appropriate calls. See, the priests were to blow the trumpets. Blowing the silver trumpets was limited to uh, the Aaronic priests, to Aaron and his sons, and um, these are things that were declared. The people who were trained to do so were the ones to, to do it. The ones who worked and served in the temple are the ones who were to make these declarations to go forth, the voice of the trumpets going forward. So again, these are ones who had been trained uh, to do so. So it's not a matter of this, guys. You have uh, many people, they, they, they get excited about, about a, a change in their life. they reborn, born again, give their life to Yahweh, and now they're a teacher, but they just got redeemed yesterday. Um, no. Now, don't let anybody take away the testimony from you. I mean, that's yours. Please share it. You know, I've been redeemed. I, I've changed paths in life. I've been brought from death to life. And uh, the, I've been restored to the Most High. And, and wow, I'm, I'm seeing a new ways to live. And I'm seeing that there's a better way than the stuff I've been doing. Share that. Get that out there. But that doesn't mean that you are now in a place of being a teacher to people. Okay? Um, share what the Father's doing in your life. And share the conversations about what you're studying and about what you're reading. There's a difference between doing that and actually being a teacher to teach people. Uh, we, we, we need to have people who are solid, who are consistent, and have been trained and have been uh, in the Word for a while. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, just things to keep in mind. We need to be careful of the voices that we're listening to and the voices that we're allowing to speak into our life, as well as our own voice going out. All right. Okay, so the Aaron and his sons were to sound these. Where was it to be done? Well, this is interesting because in the Mishkan, in the or in the Beit Hamikdash, we even see that in the temple, we've we've uh, seen recently some uncovering of some stones. This one is the trumpeting stone. This uh, this is a replica. Okay, the original is in a museum. But if you go up to the Temple Mount, you can see this, and this is where it would be uh, a picture of where it would be given from. Right, you can see there's an inscription in there. But there's uh, only a partial inscription. The, the stone has fallen from where it was, and it has been busted. And so we do not have the full picture here. So the inscription reads, Levet Hatkia Lehach, and the word breaks off. So the first two words, Levet Hatkia, mean to the place of trumpeting, but the last word is incomplete. Now, many scholars have suggested that the completing inscription, that, that, the, that the phrase would be complete by saying lehekal, meaning to the temple. So in other words, to the place of trumpeting, to the temple, or lehekon, means for the priest, or lehekriz, which means to announce. Now the latter suggestion, which would make the inscription read to the place of trumpeting to announce, has the most support. So it would read levet hakia lehekriz. So it would mean uh, to the place of trumpeting to announce. In other words, where do we go to pronounce and, and make these declarations from the trumpets? From a very high place in the temple. And so this is inscribed, so there it is, you know, kind of a thing, right? Now, where else do we see some things in the temple in high places? Luke 4, 9, speaking of Hasatan, he took Yeshua to Yerushalayim, and he set him on the highest point of the temple. He said to him, if you are the son of God, jump from here. Well, the highest point, or the pinnacle of the temple, was the southeast corner overlooking the Kidron Valley. According to Josephus, anyone who looked down from the summit would be giddy. His sight would be unable to encompass such an immense depth. <laughs> also, equally high as the pinnacle was the southwest corner near Robinson's Arch. This was known as the place of trumpeting. All right. So Josephus tells us that the trumpeter stood here to announce the beginning and the end of Shabbat. In 1968, among the collapsed stones below Robinson's Arch, a corner piece about eight feet long was found, bearing a fragment of Hebrew inscription, which reads, To the place of trumpeting too. So, this was a place where they would go and they would sound the, sound the trumpets and sound the alarms to let the people know what's happening and, and uh, instruction for the people. And again, as you blow through the trumpet, the, 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 the wind, the, the breath, the air blows through the trumpet, and of course, kind of a symbolizing the Ruach moving through the trumpet, causing it to come to life and giving voice to that. Okay? There's, there's a lot more to be said about that. So what we learn in this is that at the voice or at the word or at the mouth of Yahweh, we move. 
we move. We move at his voice. We move as he declares. We move as his direction. Acts 17, 28 says, For in him we live, we move, and have our being. So we your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Rav Shaul was speaking to, uh, speaking to the people, and he said, Even as, as some of your own poets have said. So he was, again, quoting extra-biblical sources to try to talk to the people. He was using where they were okay, to try to give an understanding to who Yahweh is. But there's truth to that. In Yahweh, we live, we move, and we have our being. So how do we, how do we know this, and how do they move, and how are all these things going on? Well, let's talk about, now we get to the ark. Let's talk about the ark for a minute. As the ark, as, as the cloud would move, and the ark would move, and, and, and they would pack up the camp, and, and the people, and, and the, and the, and, and the Kohenim, they would come in to, to grab the ark, and they would walk with the ark. There were some declarations that were to be made. All right, so we learn this in Numbers 10, 35, and 36, which is a very interesting passage of scripture that has a lot of Midrash, and it also has a lot of uh, Christian commentary as well. You know, there's been a lot of theologians to talk about these two uh, verses as well. So one of the things we learn from this is that many consider these two verses to be a book within itself. They, they divide the book of Numbers into the part that comes before these two verses and the part that comes after these two verses and these two verses, meaning they divide this book into three separate parts. All right. So we have within this book, three books. So it's not just one, it's counted as three by many people. The reason for that being is kind of like you have things that lead up to this point, but then you have this revelation and then how the people walk in that from that point forward. So again, it's a matter of the word being applied, the word being used, but what is this revelation that we see here? There's a lot that's said on it. We'll just cover one part of it, okay? So in Numbers 10, 35 and 36, it says, when the ark moved forward, Moshe said, arise, Adonai, may your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it stopped, he said, Return, Adonai, to the many, many thousands of Israel. Now, the interesting thing here is in this, in this phrase, uh, before and after these two verses, you have something in the Torah scrolls that's written and it's consistent from Torah scroll to Torah scroll, hundreds of years. Um, it, it's, it's in all of them. What we find is there are two inverted nuns, that bookcase, if you will, uh, these, this, these two verses of scripture. So it's kind of like uh, where we would kind of like insert a parenthetical and put, put something in there. It's like, okay, we have a, a common theme. We're in the middle of a sentence, but for the sake of clarification, we're going to throw this in parentheses and then we're going to continue with our theme. That's kind of what we're looking at here, but that's an oversimplification of, of what's being said here. So what do we mean by the two inverted noons and uh, what's that got to do with anything in this passage of scripture? Well, a noon, uh, I believe that the letters have meanings and as do many theologians and commentaries and, and midrashes from the time. So each Hebrew letter has a numerical equivalent and has a, a meaning in and of itself. And uh, nun represents life and uh, the, the, or the quickening of life. And some, some have drawn it like a fish, like a fish that would spring to life or a seed that would, that would uh, spring forth in life. And if you want to be technical, even the, the ancient Hebrew noon, the Paleo Hebrew noon, even looks like uh, sperm, you know, life that, that is coming forward. So all of this is meaning life. So if you have a noon that represents life, what would it mean if the noon was inverted? So you have something that means life and you invert it. So what's, what is the opposite? It would be death, but it still represents life. So what we're looking at here is a representation of life from death. Now we get to look at some other things. Life from death, we're talking about resurrection. We're talking about Yeshua's resurrection and yours. How does all this fit in here? Well, let's, let's look at a few things, a couple of scriptures as well. In Job 14, 12 through 15, it says, So man lies down and rise not, till the heavens be no more, they shall not wake, nor be raised out of their sleep. 
Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would keep me secret until your wrath be passed, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. And you will call, and I will answer you, and you will have a desire to the work of your hands. What he's saying basically is I'm dead, and I'm waiting for the time when you call, and I will answer. Resurrection, that he will rise again. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead will live, my corpse will rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the morning dew, and the earth will bring the ghost to life. Amazing scripture there. In, and it can be translated as, Your dead will live, they will raise with my body. They will raise together with me, kind of thing. Well, when Yeshua rose again, you know, he was in the grave, death, burial. Right When he resurrected, Scripture tells us that many graves were opened in Jerusalem, and many came out. And then we talk about uh, being resurrected with him, right? And we talk about all this. When he says, rise, Lord, let your enemies be scattered, we're talking about victory. And, and Yeshua overcame death, hell, and the grave by his rising, by his resurrection. Rise, Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let them who hate you flee before you. That is talking about him and his resurrection. Look at Romans 6. Uh, let's read verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were immersed in the Messiah Yeshua were immersed into his death? Therefore, if we were buried together with him through immersion into death, in order that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have become joined together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also will be joined together in his resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, so that the sinful body might be done away with, so we no longer serve sin. For he who has died is set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9, we know that the Messiah, having been raised from the dead, no longer dies. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also continually count yourselves both dead to sin and alive to God in Messiah Yeshua. Matthew 22 31, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Colossians 2.15 says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. In Job 19.25, it says, I know my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Look at this. He says, I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand. We're cum. He shall stand. He shall rise at the latter day, at the last day upon the earth. Afar, which means dust, earth, and clay. So he shall stand and rise on the last day, the rise of the clay, the dust of the earth. That's us. That's our bodies. That's, that's where we came from. Adam was taken from the clay of the earth. And so he says, and though I know, though I'm dead, I know in my flesh I shall see God. Amazing things we're looking at, guys. So Numbers 10.35 it says, and it came to pass when the ark set forward, Moshe said, rise up, Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee before you. This is Yeshua's resurrection, where he was triumphant, and he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And then verse 36, and when it rested, he said, return, O Yahweh, unto the many millions of thousands of Israel. Guys, there wasn't that many in Israel. You know, if you're reading through this, it's talking about a number that doesn't exist. You know, at that time, there was not this many in Israel. So what are we talking about? Who is this myriads, these thousands of millions or millions of thousands? I mean, call it whatever you want. All these people of Israel. No, this is all his people of Israel, all of those who have been redeemed and called by his name. This is all of his people waiting to be gathered in together 
at the end of days, at the last days. Wow, this is our resurrection and Messiah's return. Romans 4, 17, or 14, 7 says, For none of us lives for himself, and none of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Messiah died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. May that be a, a, a decree for us in this time. May we be part of that voice that, that, that goes forward and, and the trumpets that are sounding to declare, Rise, Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee from before you. And return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel, your people. May we continually seek the Yahweh go before us and that we follow him and that each day we, we pray that he is here, evident, living in our lives. And we're waiting for the full redemption of his return. Yes, he's redeemed you now, but we're waiting still for his return, the final redemption, to bring us all back into a place to be with him eternally, forever. Guys, that's what we're talking about. Well, that's a lot to talk about in, the, in, in this passage, isn't it? So, that's all we've got for today, though. So, if these, uh, if these teachings have been a blessing to you, I pray they have, please share them. Please help get the word out. Help, help get the life going forward. If it's been a blessing to you, let it be a blessing to someone else. And if it has been a blessing to you, please consider making a donation to help us to continue to put these out there, to continue to work with these and, and help to keep the word continually moving out there. And whatever format that, uh, that you watch or listen or whatever, you can, can help get them out and help share them out that way. So uh, until next time, I, I, I pray this has been a blessing to you and I pray that you're blessed and that you be a blessing. All right. So until next time, show them. Thank you.